Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. 1 Nephi 21.16 1. Lisa came to me on that fateful evening of revelation and beguilement. Her purple hair was almost as wild as were her eyes, those wide, intoxicated orbs. Her pixy face had lost its usual mirth. She was dead serious. "'You must see Nyarlathotep,' she panted, refusing the chair that I had offered her, preferring to frantically pace the wooden floor. One hand clutched a large canvas that was covered with a thin sheet of cloth. "'It amazes me,' I said, smiling patiently, "'that hair as short as yours can look so disarrayed. "'Screw the hair!' she shot back, "'at the same time running a gloved hand through the thick, unruly mess. "'You've been moaning for over a year about your inability to write, "'to dream fresh vision. "'I tell you, go see Nyarlathotep, "'and he will drench your brain with phantasm.' I doubt that the tricks of a cult figure will inspire new work from my dead pen. I recently had two squeaky clean young boys leave me a copy of some new sacred book, an absurd thing about a great old one filtering through the clouds and dwelling among the Mongol hordes of ancient America. Ah, Joe Smith's gold Bible! And now this new lord of disillusion. Stephen was over recently and told me all about this new bloke, some darky who arrived three months ago to our city of chaos. Lisa laughed. You know it's really stupid, the way you use your tired, boring cynicism as a way to stay cooped up in this pathetic little apartment and hide from the outside world. Things are happening in this city of chaos. Can't you feel it? I wearily shrugged. All I feel, dear child, is this intolerable heat wave. I've never known such appalling weather in October. Autumn is my favourite season because it heralds absolutely the death of tortuous summer, that redoubtable period when human apes strip off their gaudy attire and shriek to the cancerous sun. How you can wear such thick gloves when it is so grotesquely hot is quite beyond me. Oh, how oddly she smiled as she quickly placed one glove hand before her face and gazed at it in rapture. As she did so, I noticed two curious things. First, the gloves that encased her slender hands were not composed of cloth, but rather of some fine mesh of mauve metal, the likes of which were utterly foreign to me. Second, with the swift movement of her hand there came to me a wave of fragrance, a scent not unlike the festering of dead lilies. Something in her expression slightly unnerved me, and I felt the need to jabber on. I've not been able to sleep because of this diabolic temperature. When I am able to fetch a few winks, I have the most monstrous dreams, horrid visions that soak my flesh and shake me awake. He will make you dream, she sang. You would find your muse again if you knelt before him. Oh, please! You speak of this freak as if he were a god. By God, he could be. He looks supernal with his golden eyes and scarlet robes. I worship him. My knees grow weak with reverence whenever I think of him. Great Jesu, you're worse than that timid little Stephen was when he came to tell me of his encounter with this strange black beast. Screw that little gay boy. His teeny brain couldn't endure stunning revelation. The prophecy of Nyarlathotep augurs ill for pea brains. His vision may be brutal, but it rocks. Ah, what a modern girl you are, with your punk rock parlance and thrift store clothes. Such stunning vocabulary makes one feel one's age. I fear I'm far too faded for such radical visions and wonders as you hint of. You see, you do that all the time, using your age as an excuse to be a vacillating little shut-in who can't make up his mind about life. Will you write today, or merely whine? Will you dare to really dream, or merely sit in bed and fantasize about cowboys? Don't be crude. 
It's been ages since I've wanked about Clint Walker. And you have gone on long enough about bold new vision and great creative guts. Stop your muscled mouth and show me this new thing you've done that is supposed to induce me to dress in fevered pitch and rush to kiss the palm of this moron with the theatrical name. Deeply inhaling, Lisa placed her hands together in a semblance of prayer. With the movement of her hands I became aware once more of some peculiar odour, one that did not inspire my lips to smile. Expecting her to remove her gloves, I frowned in perplexity when she did not. Pulling from my desk my straight back chair of solid oak, she placed it in front of me and rested the covered canvas upon it. She seemed so excited, and yet a wee bit apprehensive as well, and to try and lighten her mood, I thought to playfully annoy her by yawning in feigned ennui. She took no notice of me, however, choosing rather to place her face into her sheathed hands and rock nervously to and fro, humming a weird little melody beneath her breath. I knew that she could be a creature of raw, unregulated nerves, yet I had never witnessed in her such queer behaviour. First, she whispered, in a voice that was almost musical with veneration. Tell me what you know of Nyarlathotep. I was growing quite weary of that obscene name. However, I complied. Very well, as you wish. Now, what did young Stephen tell me? Let me rack my brain. Delicately, I touched hand to brow. This person with the preposterous cognomen came to our city in middle or late June. He rented that old lecture hall where the J-dubs used to hold meetings so as to lure souls to dreary salvation. Rumour whispers that this darkie crawled through the blackness of several centuries to our modern age. Thus we see proven that the more outlandish occult leaders claim, the more anxious are fools to follow. Stephen tells me that they do follow in droves. I watched as Lisa stopped her swaying motion and dreamily listened to my utterance. She continued to clasp her face with gloved hands. I disliked her alteration of character because it utterly befuddled me. Disturbed and irritated, I continued. I'm told that he won't allow his image to be photographed or his voice to be recorded. Early on, some poor chap smuggled a wee recording device into a lecture, but when the tape was played, all that could be heard was a weird variety of buzzing which drove the wretched bloke insane. He is, this Nyarlathotep, a splendid showman, and works a multiplicity of mechanical googaws with which he spellbinds the rabble. Funny how little Stephen shuddered when he mentioned these devices. Like you... He urged me to go and witness for myself this fantastic creature. I declined then, as I do now. The only beast I choose to worship is myself. Lisa's hands slowly fell from her face. What a lonely religion yours must be. You're so full of clever, empty talk. But I recall a dim and distant time when you spoke beautifully, when you wrote exquisite verse. I sadly sighed. Dim and distant, indeed. Look, Hiram, I know what it's like to lose energy and vision, but you can regain it. You can return to creation, instead of sitting in this dingy apartment and uttering tired, boring witticisms. Look at how Nyarlathotep has inspired me. Summarily, with almost fevered movement, she pulled the sheet from the canvas. I shouted in shock and outrage. Lisa's wonderful work had always been delightfully inventive, and filled with brilliant colour, rather in the style of Gorky. I was thus expecting a work of multi-hued genius. Instead, my eyes were insulted by a vile composition of filthy soot and blurry ink and wash, with here and there an insignificant tint of blue or purple. The scene was a titanic ruin set deep within a riotous growth of jungle. Standing among the debris of antiquity was a shrouded figure that wore no face, yet by its stance seemed haughty and implacable. The entire thing unnerved me. I know not the origin of the ruins, for they were like nothing I had experienced in art or history. Oh, yes, 
It was an original vision, but not one that I could embrace or applaud. I hated it absolutely, yet could not turn my eyes away. The image beguiled as much as it appalled. My senses were stunned by the aspect of antediluvian age that the artist had been able to evoke. But what a horrid medium for she who had once been so clever and outlandish with colour! Quivering with emotion, I turned to the witch. This is your new achievement? Oh, how I wailed! This sorry and soulless depiction of a dead and haunted past! Great heavens, how oddly she smiled! My dear Hiram, this is a vision of the dead and haunted future. I gasped with choked fury, seized with emotions I did not understand. Really, this is too utterly nauseating. Please do cover the wretched thing. I'm sorry to be blunt, but it has shocked me. Lisa made no movement, and although I turned my face away, my eyes slid inexorably to the painted surface. Savagely, I suddenly pointed to the shrouded figure. And what in the blessed name of all the gods is that supposed to be? You've not given the silly creature a face. The faceless god wears no visage. I could not refrain from shuddering. Muttering profanely, I reached for the sheet of cloth and tossed it over the canvas. Yet, even as I did so, my eyes ached to look again upon the painted surface. My companion smiled in eerie triumph. It was my turn to rise and pace the hard wooden floor. I simply do not understand why you would surrender your wonderful sense of vibrant colour and sensuous lines and replace it with ink and ash and whatever the hell this insidious current medium is. The thing lacks life. It's naught but a concoction of blur and blotch. What did you use, an old bath sponge? Ye gods, her peculiar smile. I used my fingers. She moved a few steps nearer and raised before me her hidden hands. Great Saturn, what was that monstrous stench? It was the stink of decay, yet tainted with a fragrance as I had never inhaled. It revolted and enthralled, like unto her painting. I used these fingers that he has kissed. We stood facing each other, and I watched as she slowly removed the gloves of metal webbing. Horrified at the nefarious sight before me, I cried in fright and fell into my chair, in which I cowered from the sight. Yet even as I wanted to turn my eyes away from the festering horror, I wanted to gaze upon it. The pale mists of smoke, that spilled from the tiny wounds and bruises were the origin of the unholy stench, that disgusting odour that was extraneous to any earthly redolence. She stretched nearer, and I pretended to cover my eyes. What could have caused such mutation in hands that were once so lovely? How could fingers become so mutilated and disfigured? What could have caused them to become so flattened? their tips so erased. These hands that he has blessed! No, no! Yet, even as I whimpered, I reached for one of her smoky hands and brought it to my lips. It tasted of nightmare. The nauseating smoke plunged into my nostrils and found my brain, which it ruthlessly teased with esoteric shape and shadow. I curled my nails into her transformed flesh. Lisa hissed with pain and drew her hands away. With cloudy sight I saw her indistinctly. I beheld the fuming appendages that bled from where I had clutched them. I watched them slide into their outré gloves. I watched as they reached for the sheeted painting. New vision requires radical treatment. This is the sacrosanct gift with which I have been blessed. Perhaps you lack backbone and prefer to sit here and quiver in your impotent existence. But there was a time when your world was filled with magnificent language and stunning vision. You could find that world anew, if you would visit Nyarlathotep. Her words were like needles in my brain. Weakly I tried to rise from my cosy chair, only to slip weakly from it to the floor. 
trying to blink streaming liquid from burning eyes, I crawled to where she stood. Oh, how I ached to kiss again the palsied hands, to taste their baleful substance. My fingers found her shoes. Weakly I clung to her clothing and pulled myself to a kneeling position. You must see Nyarlathotep, her strong clear voice echoed from above. He is wonderful and dreadful. He will show you prophecies of the cold bleak abysses between the stars, those places where dead gods fumble in dream-infested slumber. The great ones were. They are. They shall be. Lisa knelt beside me and put her mouth to my ear. I listened as she sucked in breath, then jolted as she unearthly howled. Instantly afterward, I was alone. Two. Thus it was in that hot October that I ventured forth one night in pursuit of Nyarlathotep. As I crept along the silent sidewalks, I passed certain individuals who looked at me queerly and askance. I sensed that they had been to see this foreigner from a land unknown. How anxious they seemed to speak to me, and yet how timidly hesitant they were, watching in silence as I slipped past them. I came at last upon the lecture hall and stopped to gaze in amazement at the throngs of lingering rabble. They leaned against the building and sat upon the curbing, congregated near the open door that led to a narrow stairway. One man was especially fidgety. I watched as he snatched at his hair and muttered loudly to himself. Then he vanished into an alley, and I shivered when from that alley there came a high and mournful howling. The baying sent a quiver of emotion through the lingering crowd. Pushing through the horde at the doorway, I slowly climbed the silent stairway. From somewhere above I heard the soft, low sound of fluted music. I walked down a dimly lit hallway that led to the double doors of a lecture room wherein I would confront an unfamiliar alien. The piping of discordant music came from behind the closed doors. My flesh prickled at the sound of it. Closing my eyes, I leaned my throbbing forehead against one of the doors, and it pushed open against the force of my leaning frame. With eyes still shut, I staggered into the room. I could smell scented candlelight. I opened heavy eyelids. He stood upon a slightly raised platform, the shrouded one, swarthy, slender, sinister. He was robed in scarlet silk. On a table beside him was a device similar to a child's magic lantern. Its diseased illumination cast obscene and spinning shapes upon the black walls. My attention was caught by the nebulous form that squatted at the feet of Nyarlathotep, the thing that held in clumsy paws an apparatus of tinted ivory or pale gold. It was from this instrument that the fluted music emerged. Yet the more I tried to scrutinise the gadget, the more it seemed to subtly fluctuate in form, reshaping with a sensual and seething movement that ached my skull. I listened to what sounded like whipping wings, as the music melted into silence. My eyes demanded closure, and on their lids I beheld swirling shapes that madly moved before me. These spinning shapes inspired dizziness, and suddenly my knees weakened, and my legs crumbled. I fell to the floor. Weakly, I raised my agonizing head. He stood before me, grim, austere, merciless. My hungry mouth kissed his chilly feet. The room was still, silent. Slightly raising my head, I looked about, but the creature that had performed music had vanished. Boldly, I clung to Nyarlathotep's scarlet garment and climbed to a standing position. Swirling light and shadow played upon his regal face. Fantastically, he smiled, and as he did so, his visage slightly slipped, as though he wore some tight-fitting mask that had momentarily lost hold. He lifted a hand, and I saw upon his palm an emblem that pulsed with sentience. Tilting my head to it, I licked the captivating insignia. It was sharp, 
and ripped the tongue that touched it. I drank my blood as the creature moved his hand away, then jolted as he swiftly pressed that palm against my forehead. It felt as though splinters of bubbling ice had pierced my brain. I was inside Lisa's painting. The awful heat that had so plagued our autumn season hung heavily in the dead air. To breathe was to burn. He stood before me still, the ancient one, composed of shifting shapes that composed and decomposed his semblance. I looked beyond him at the mammoth buildings, the ruins of a far distant time. It was a time over which Nyarlathotep was master absolute. But how could he still exist in future epoch? How had he escaped the nip of death? That cannot die, which stands outside time and space, he lowly uttered. Behind him I detected a throng of writhing black gargoyles that mindlessly pranced beneath a dying sun. Why did I ache to join in their dance? Oh, how his liquid mark burned upon my brow! Scorching wind arose and pushed into my eyes, burning wind that forced my eyes to close. A large rough hand poked at my face. Opening eyes, I beheld a lean young man who gazed at me in desperation. I watched the mouth that twitched in an effort to talk, but was unable to function. I watched the blackness that crept into his trembling eyes, and watched as he raised his head and howled in lunacy. I escaped him, and rushed along the nighted pavement, to the seedy house that Lisa shared with her epileptic mother. My brain blazed with vision, with a prophecy of disaster that I ached to share with one who knew and understood. I was filled with a kind of lust to gaze once more upon the image of her painting, to bow before the likeness of a faceless god. Not pausing to knock, I boldly entered the dark and dusty living room. A lamp glowed with pallid light beside a worn and battered sofa, upon which was sprawled an elderly woman. Her twisted body oddly contorted, and puzzled eyes watched the crooked fingers that locked and unlocked. She did not look at me as she spoke. You don't need to stay. She's quiet now. I'll leave it up to you. I didn't like the way she howled in that funny way. But she's quiet now. You don't need to stay. It's up to you. I left her to her confusion and walked the cluttered hallway that led to Lisa's studio. I could smell incense and also that other fragrance, born of my friend's altered state. Pausing before the studio door, I leaned my brow upon it. Slowly, it pushed open. Her lifeless form lay on the floor, its arms sprawled over a large white canvas. An overwhelming stench emanated from the stubs that had once been hands, those nubs that stank and smoked. I knelt beside her, the terrible eyes, wide open, still wore their wild expression. I looked to the image on canvas, the image composed of the filament of transfigured flesh. I saw the hooded figure composed of soot and shadow. From deep within the folds of its hood, I could discern the shifting features of a regal and inhuman façade. Yet even as I gazed, the features faded into blackness. I raised my shivering face. I closed my liquid eyes. I stretched my mouth with baying.